good morning, MSU community. My name is Dr. Wanda Lipscomb. I am Senior Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and Associate Dean for Student Affairs in the College of Human Medicine. And I am Luis Alonso Garcia. I'm the Director of Migrant Student Services. Mr. Garcia and I are the co-chairs of the MSU Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Steering Committee. We were charged by President Stanley to conduct a comprehensive planning process focused on MSU's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Together with our committee members, we have been working to identify barriers to a fuller realization of these values at MSU and to develop a DEI strategic planning framework. The framework is intended to lay the groundwork for long-term system-wide change and will be shared later this semester. During the course of our work to create this long-term plan and a series of events that have shed light on systemic racism at the campus level and in the broader community, President Stanley requested that we in the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives appoint a task force on racial equity. A group of committed faculty, staff, and students with focused expertise in diversity, equity, and inclusion were identified to serve on this task force. The task force was charged to consider and identify a set of immediate actions centered around campus climate and safety, policing, and faculty and staff diversity. A little over a week ago, President Stanley shared the recommendations from the group with the campus community and provided an opportunity for you to share your questions that we will address later in this webcast. Today, you will hear from our MSU president, Dr. Samuel Stanley, our vice president and chief diversity officer, Dr. Jabbar Bennett, and Dr. Jennifer Cobina, Chair of the Policing Subcommittee, who will walk through these recommendations and respond to your pre-submitted questions. With that, we welcome President Stanley, Dr. Bennett, and Dr. Cobina to share their insights and recommendations. President Stanley, we will begin with you. So thank you, Dr. Lipscomb. And I want to begin by thanking you and Mr. Garcia and your committee for all the great work you've been doing for Michigan State University. And as you went about that work last year, uh, we all witnessed those disturbing images and reports of fatal encounters of Black Americans with police. Those terrifying incidents brought all types of people into the streets across the country to protest, including many of us at MSU. Having a university that is safe, welcoming, respectful, and supportive requires the community's trust in our police. And it became clear to me that the subject of policing should be examined through the lens of racial equity at Michigan State University as a part of the task force's charge. So we called on one of our own experts in this area, Dr. Jennifer Cobina, and I'm grateful she agreed to lead this working group. A new police chief is coming and there are already changes being made to how we think about and approach policing on campus, as I explained in my written response. But these recommendations provide a concrete foundation to build upon as we discuss, consider, and make further changes as we go forward. So all of the members of the task force have my thanks for their contributions. I wanna now ask our Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Jabbar Bennett, to add some introductory comments. He will be a key figure in ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion responsibilities are acknowledged and embraced across the university. Welcome, Dr. Bennett. Thank you, President Stanley. And I look forward to working with you, the police department, and others to help ensure the safety and well being of all Spartans, including students, faculty, and staff. Here at MSU and around the country, people look to police officers for safety, crime prevention, and in general to uphold the law. Safety from those who may intend to do harm, help to prevent, detect, and investigate crimes committed against unsuspecting and vulnerable individuals, and a commitment to uphold established laws, policies, principles, and norms meant to give all Spartans an unwavering sense of security. But as the nation continues to witness and be marred by incidents of police brutality 
and the killing of unarmed black people and others, it is imperative that we underscore our expectations of MSU law enforcement personnel. We must ensure that MSU police officers are aware of and work to address inherent power imbalances, as well as actual and perceived notions of mistreatment, especially when interacting with members of the black community and other marginalized groups. It is our responsibility to monitor these interactions, establish accountability, and provide law enforcement officers with the necessary training and support they need. Because we have to remember that these police officers are Spartans too. This working group has clearly outlined several immediate and long-term actions that can move us forward together. And it will take every Spartan to help create and maintain the safe, welcoming, respectful, and supportive campus that we aspire to be. Thank you. And Dr. Lipscomb, back to you. Thank you, President Stanley and Dr. Bennett for your kind words. I now welcome Dr. Kobina for a presentation of the recommendations from her subcommittee. Welcome, Dr. Kobina. Thank you. Um, I would certainly like to thank all of the committee members who were part of the subcommittee. Together, we provide short, intermediate, and long-term goals. So I'll just get right into it. We are aware that while there is an anti-bias unit within the police department, up until recently, it only consisted of one person. So we recommend expanding the anti-bias inclusion unit to include hiring an administrative assistant, a communication specialist, and a team of social workers and counselors. And we also recommend that officers should receive anti-bias training on an ongoing basis. With regards to the uh, reprioritizing the budget, with 76 police officers within the MSU Police Department, we recommend a hiring freeze. In the short term, we do suggest appointing a review committee that would be tasked with reviewing the short, reviewing the police budget in order to ascertain where funds are spent, how the MSU Police Department compares to other police departments across other academic institutions, to also determine how much funds to cut and where to cut funds. We would also like to see the same review committee assess how many cases that officers are deployed to when responding to calls and investigate, and investigate whether police officers have to be first responders to calls or if mental health clinicians and social workers would be better suited to address issues such as mental health crises. As a result, when it comes to proactive services, we suggest that mental health professionals conduct wellness checks. We made this suggestion because if someone has a mental health problem, it would be ideal that a mental health worker be involved in seeing that individual. If, if officers, however, do respond to wellness checks, we suggest that the officer not be armed. We made this suggestion because when armed police officers re respond to mental health calls, it sends the message that having a mental illness or an episode is a crime. We know, however, that there may be quite a bit of pushback on officers not being armed because it is possible that a call can deteriorate into a life-threatening situation. And so if officers do stay armed, we do believe it would be wise to have a highly trained and equipped mental health professional out in the field with the officer in order to de-escalate a situation. While we suggest a hiring freeze of officers, if additional hires are to take place, then we recommend hiring more mental health and social workers within the police department. But we also suggest hiring substantially more mental health workers outside of the police department that work both day and evening shifts, as we know that a mental health crisis can take place at any hour of the day. MSU also needs to take proactive steps to ensure students' needs are met. This means making sure that students are aware of resources on campus. We believe that it's important to address the root causes as to why some may engage in illicit activity, which would ultimately warrant a police presence. In terms of accountability, we recommend establishing a police oversight committee that's comprised of faculty, staff, students, and community members who have the power to make change as opposed to simply being advisory. This committee uh, should be racially and ethnically diverse, as well as well-versed in issues pertaining to policing and race. For the sake of increased accountability and transparency, police should not investigate officer misconduct that takes place within the department. This should be done by an external investigator. Human resources should also conduct exit interviews among those who leave the police department. And while this is supposed to happen, we are aware that exit interviews have not been conducted among those officers who have left the police department. 
In terms of standard operating procedures, the police department should not be militarized. Armored vehicles and military equipment should not be used on campus. We made this recommendation because numerous studies show that police militarization is linked disproportionately to, to black and brown individuals. We are also well, uh, well aware that police officers often have poor mental health. Evidence suggests that nationally, about 80% of officers suffer from chronic stress and 16% report being suicidal and or having substance abuse problems. Yet 90% of officers never seek mental health services. And so since the job of an officer is stressful and can at times be traumatic, we, re we recommend mandatory psychological counseling at least two, two times a year, perhaps quarterly, and after a violent or tragic encounter uh, has been witnessed or experienced. We believe that this would help to normalize and remove the stigma that's attached to mental health services. As relates to peaceful protests, uh, we, we recommend that police should not be in attendance of peaceful protests. If, however, they are in attendance, have, it's important to have clear protocols for handling peaceful protests, and we do recommend eliminating the use of tear gas within the police department. And as a centerpiece of all training, as it relates to professional development, uh, curricula should devote substantial hours to topics other than operations and weapons training. Uh, fo the focus should, however, be on de-escalation, problem solving, and ethics. We also suggest that police receive ongoing training in de-escalation that is both verbal and nonverbal for those who are hearing impaired. And officers should also receive ongoing training in interacting with people who are experiencing a mental health crisis or who may be neurodivergent. In terms of intermediate goals, we do recommend reducing the number of police officers within the police department. And that is, as people retire, we suggest replacing them with civilians who are not carrying a weapon, such as social workers and mental health professionals who can ultimately respond to nonviolent calls. And as it relates to accountability, during orientation, we recommend that students receive the training that's needed in order to file a complaint against officers who may engage in misconduct. We also suggest having outside people involved in the selection process of police officers. And if additional officers are hired, we do recommend that effort uh, be made to hire individuals uh, who, are, who come from diverse uh, racial ethnic backgrounds and who, all, who also have diverse language skills. And in order to avoid re-traumatizing survivors of police abuse and violence, the MSU Police Department should set up a system for mental health clinicians, social workers, as well as the anti-bias unit to communicate with survivors following an incident. One of the things that we recommend pertaining to professional development is to have a, um, a, a department-wide professional development that includes the uh, police community reconciliation framework. So this is an approach that has been used at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and it entails having frank engagements between racial and ethnic minorities, as well as law enforcement, in order to address historical tensions, grievances, and misconceptions that contribute to mutual dis mistrust and also misunderstanding that can prevent police and community members from working together. And as it relates to the long-term goals, uh, one of the things we, we note in the recommendations is that we know that in an ideal world, people with an appropriate training and skill set, they would be the ones to respond to calls. So for example, having social workers and mental health care, uh, mental health clinicians responding to calls. Also in an ideal world, when police officers respond to calls, uh, they should not be carrying their weapons unless there is a clear threat, such as having an active shooter on campus. And the police subcommittee, we did discuss um, abolishing the police. There were a small number of the committee who did have very strong feelings about the possibility of abolishing the police. However, this was not the majority. Uh, we are like the nation that is grappling with this very big issue, whether to have the police or not. The police subcommittee could not come to a consensus as to whether the police department should be abolished. However, we do hope that this report will serve as a guide uh, for the search committee and the firm in hiring a responsive police chief who is committed to protecting and serving every constituent on campus. And so with that said, I would like to thank Dr. Lipscomb, President Stanley, and Dr. Bennett for this opportunity to share the recommendations that are derived from the police subcommittee. Thank you, Dr. Kobina. I will now share a few of the questions collected from the community feedback in response to this report. This is meant to be a dialogue, so President Stanley and Dr. Bennett, please free, feel free to add your perspectives. 
What specific steps will MSU Police Department put in place to mend students' view of police, especially Black students? So I think the reorganization that's taking place currently and, and really was done in part in response to the uh, recommendations of the task force uh, is designed to really improve the alignment of resources to bolster inclusion uh, and the anti-bias units. And that's critically important. And again, with, as was mentioned by Dr. Kobina. And I think the other thing is that while the MSU police have had a strong history in the past of community policing, I think there had been over the years perhaps a pull away from that. So I think again, an emphasis on community policing policing and getting engaged with the constituents, which of course are students, faculty, staff, as well as members of the community. Um, I think the other thing that's important is we want to make sure as we hire a new police chief, and we're in the process of completing that as I speak now, we want someone who understands the issues in the community and can relate to them. And I think that's going to be an important component uh, as we move the force forward. Thank you. In your recommendations, you mention abolishing the police. What does that actually mean from your point of view? How specifically and statistically are the police keeping us safe? And what would be the alternative in keeping our campus community safe from violent offenses if we did not have a police presence on campus? Sure, so in the recommendations, we did mention that a small sub subset of the committee wanted to see the police abolished. You know, and when some are pushing for abolishing the police, they are really pushing for abolishing the systems and structures that are rooted in oppression. So too often uh, racial hostility and racial bias can become normative police practices that target individuals of color. Um, and when it comes to police keeping uh, people safe, the statistics show that 1,000 men, women, and children are killed each year by the police, and hundreds more are brutalized and abused. You know, according to data from the FBI, Black people are three and a half times more likely than white individuals to be killed by the police when they do not have a weapon or are not attacking anyone. You know, so it's not uncommon for some officers to make inferences that can be laced with stereotypes when they do not have much information about a person. And so you'll notice throughout the recommendations, uh, the committee has strongly pushed for a heavier reliance on mental health clinicians and social workers to respond to nonviolent situations. Data shows that nine out of 10 calls to the police are for nonviolent encounters. And now we, this does not mean that an incident will not turn violent, but police at times, they can contribute to the escalation of violent force. So, uh, police officers' skill sets and training are often out of sync with the social interactions that they have. Um, officers are mostly trained in use of force tactics and worst case scenarios in order to reduce potential threats. However, uh, most of these interactions with civilians we know first start with a conversation. And so creating a structure that allows for our mental health and uh, social workers to do, to do work in nonviolent situations is really another way to try to keep people safe. And of course, additional training for officers to address violent crime and also to try to deescalate situations is what, what we've also called for. I just wanna comment on the thoughtfulness and care that, that Dr. Cabina, that you and your working group really put into this particular recommendation, which really, truly first helps to ensure the safety and security of all of our community members, especially those who are Black and people of color and members of our other marginalized groups who've experienced uh, interactions that, um, again, don't always meet the standards we would uh, hope, but also in thinking about how to support officers uh, in their professional development and training um, and also to understand what our community standards are in alignment with our institutional values. So thank you again. I, I, I just add that, uh, again, I really appreciate the, the care and, and, and thought that went into these recommendations as well, all of them, actually. I, I do think I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that total police abolition, uh, I, I agree with the, I think, the majority of the committee, is really not consistent with our responsibility, at, I think, to keep the whole campus community safe. Um, the police had 10,000 calls that they responded to in 2019. Average time for an immediate response is two minutes. Um, and I think one of the challenges we face, we're all aware of shootings that have taken place on campus. We've seen the violence that took place on the Capitol where I think a more present police force would have made a difference in that. 
Um, so I think we do have reasons really to almost to protect people who protest on campus um, to make sure that we have a police force that's prepared for those types of things. So, so I think, again, we, this is such a difficult issue. And again, we want to make sure we're respectful of everyone on campus. But I do think at this point in time in the society we live in, uh, that it's very difficult to imagine not having a police force that's designed to totally protect and serve everyone on our campus. And that's the goal we have to achieve. Our final question, can you further expand on the benefits of increasing social work and mental health clinicians in the police force and reducing armed officers? I think you have actually commented on that um, during our previous questions, but any additional thoughts? Sure. You know, definitely, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the calls that police officers respond to are uh, not necessarily uh, violent in nature or even criminal. Uh, rather, many of the calls are for mental health crises and arguments resulting uh, from interpersonal conflicts. Um, and so it, it can, at times, you know, officers can show up but not always offer longstanding uh, solutions, which can ultimately lead to repeated calls for that for the same problem. Um, and um, it's also not fair to expect officers to solve every problem that uh, society has failed to address. And it's also not the right way to address uh, some of these challenges that we're facing. So ultimately, social workers can help to reduce repeat emergency. Uh, they can help to reduce repeat emergency calls while also getting uh, students the help that they need that officers may not necessarily have the skills or resources or time to provide. Um, so hiring social workers and mental health clinicians makes sense given that they've also dedicated their lives to de-escalating situations and addressing mental health crises, uh, family crises, as well as a crises um, that are the result of trauma. And so this approach would actually take uh, the onus off of officers and they can instead focus on more serious and violent offenses. And I'll just add again, uh, I appreciate the thought you're putting into recommending our officers be trained to recognize many of the invisible challenges or ways that many of the people who they're responding to may present as you talk about mental health challenges and as you talk about how people may be um, stigmatized or, or traumatized based on previous um, incidents. It's really important that our officers are aware uh, of the very thoughtful approach and really holistic sort of thinking around engagement with members of our community. Thank you. This has been a really great dialogue and I look forward to the continued work we will see in the implementation of the DEI plan. President Stanley, do you have any closing comments? Uh, I, I think as we heard, this was a very thoughtful report from an expert group uh, in this area, and uh, we're paying very, very close attention. And as we welcome a new police chief to Michigan State University, I think this is going to be a great document to help them uh, as they engage uh, with the community and think about how we bring our police force to the place we want it to be, to make sure that it serves that primary purpose of keeping our community safe. Thank you. Mr. Garcia, would you please close us out? Thank you, Dr. Covina, President Stanley, Dr. Bennett, and everyone who is joining us virtually. If you would like to further review the recommendations from the DEI Task Force on Racial Equity, the response from the president, and other series, please visit the president's initiative webpage. This concludes the webcast for today. We want, you to, we want to remind you to please stay safe and we hope to see you once we all return to campus. Thank you.